What's up guys? Today, I wanna to share some information with you about how I use visual analysis tools to improve my mixing and mastering. And I've been using visual tools for a long time as an engineer. One of my favorites is the free Voxango Span. A lot of you will have heard of it before. There's a ton of tutorials out there already on Voxango Span, and I'm definitely not trying to reinvent the wheel here. What I hope to share with you guys is something new and unique that I haven't seen covered yet in a tutorial. So if you wanna look at the basics of Voxango Span and how to set it up, I highly recommend the tutorials by Dan Worrell and by Ahi. I'll link both of those below in the description for you. So let's just first talk about why you might want to use a visual tool like a spectrum analyzer to help you get better mix downs. So reason number one is because when you're mixing on studio monitors in a room, that room is going to have some inconsistencies to it. It's hard to find a perfect room unless you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a tuned space designed by an acoustician. And most people aren't in that scenario, myself included. So the room is going to have things like room modes and modal ringing that are going to cause you to hear things that are not actually there in your music. So what it means is when you take your track to another location and you play it, and it's a space that doesn't have those problems, all of a sudden your mix falls apart and it doesn't translate. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is because of the filtration effect that happens in the human brain. We've probably all had a friend that lives next to an airport or a railway line, and we go over to their place and we're like, doesn't that bother you, that crazy loud sound? And they're like, what? And the reason for that is because the human brain filters out repetitive sounds that it doesn't perceive as a threat so that it can prioritize processing power for new and novel sounds that might be a threat. You know, it's ancient programming. So this actually works to our detriment when we're mastering and mixing music because we're listening to the same sections over and over again and trying to be objective and we're just not because the brain begins to de-emphasize and filter out certain sounds that might otherwise jump out to us. So you probably have had this happen to you. You do a mix, you give it a week or a few days or maybe somebody else comes in and listens to it. In either case, the listener has fresh ears and all of a sudden something is glaringly obvious and you're wondering to yourself, how did I miss that when I was mixing this track? And that's because of the filtration effect. So when you're using a visual tool like a spectrum analyzer, you also see things that your ears might not be hearing. Or rather, your ears are hearing it, but your brain is de-emphasizing the importance of it, so it kind of blends in. Okay, so those are a couple of really solid reasons to use visual mixing tools. I use them all the time. They're a really key part of my process, and Voxengo Span is one of my top plugins that I use. So let's talk about the process that I'm using. Many of you who are familiar with Isotope's plugin line maybe will have seen the matching EQ. This is something I've been using for a long time. Basically, what you can do is you can create a snapshot of the spectrum, the overall averaged spectrum of a reference track, and then you can take a snapshot of your track that you're trying to target, and you can compare the differences between them, and then you can even dial in EQ to be able to get yours to match the reference. Now, a couple things with that. One is, unless you have the Isotope suite, you're not gonna have that. So I wanted to offer something to you guys that you could do with freeware. And two, I actually don't like using matching EQ on the master. I much prefer to just take a look at the difference between two spectrums and then learn from that. So you might see that your high end in your track is like two or three decibels lower than the high end in a reference track. Do you always wanna match a reference track exactly? No, you have your own unique mix. It might have different elements in it, but it is really useful to see if some area of your track is out when compared to even several reference tracks. So it's really useful to take a look at your spectrum versus another track spectrum. And this was always difficult to do unless you were using the Isotope matching EQ. Voxango Span allows you to put it as an insert on something and you can see it dancing around and you can kind of look at the spectrum of a reference track and then you can look at another copy of Voxango Span and look at yours, but you can never see them overlaid. And that's what I want to show you guys today. There's a way of overlaying one spectrum from your track over another spectrum from a reference track and looking at the differences between them. And in particular, I also dial in some settings on span where you're not looking at these momentary bouncing parts because you might see a kick drum coming in and spiking and then it goes away. What I like to look at as an engineer is the averaged spectrum so that it sums over time and you're looking at say your drop as a whole versus the drop of the reference track as a whole. 
So let's get into it. I wanna show you guys exactly the settings that I'm using in Span. I wanna show you the routings and the process to be able to get that. I'm gonna be demoing this in Ableton Live and there's actually something brand new in Ableton Live that allows a really amazing routing that makes this super easy. So regardless of whatever DAW you guys are on, you'll get something out of this. And without further ado, let's get into it. I've got a session open here in live where I'm comparing one of my masters with a group of four fairly similar reference tracks. There's differences between them and I wanted to get a feel for how they compare as a group with what I've done on my mix and master. So I've got Voxango Span as an insert on my master and I've got all the settings dialed. I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step step how to do this, but to start, I just wanted to show you what we're going for. Okay, so the dark blue area is my master and the light green line is the reference track. So let me just delete span and we'll rebuild everything from scratch. One thing I wanna point out first is that I have looped up the drop of my master and then I've aligned the drop or the heaviest sections, the chorus, if you will, of the reference tracks to be at the same location. So when I'm referencing everything back and forth and looking at span, it's the chorus or the drop of the tune that I'm comparing. And that's really important because if you just let them go unsynced like that, you might be comparing the verse or uh, a breakdown of one track to the drop or the chorus of yours. And obviously they're gonna look wildly different at that point. So let's go ahead and drop span in. I'm using my collections up here for live 10 and I have analysis tools all kind of as shortcuts, which is a good thing to do. So we're dropping in span and it's critical here that you use the VST2 version because we need the audio sidechain input right here to be able to overlay one spectrum over another in real time. If you grab a different version of span, it won't have it. So this right here is the AU version of span. And if we drop that in, you'll notice there's no audio sidechain input. So critical that you're using the VST2 version, which maybe is why I haven't seen anybody else do this technique before. It's a little hidden. And one thing I will also say is that the manual on this, given that it's a freeware plugin, is pretty sparse. There's a lot of stuff that I was trying to figure out by reading the manual, and it's really light documentation that doesn't cover a lot of the stuff that I'm about to cover. So let's quickly go through how to tweak span to get it to look the way that I was just showing you. Here's how it looks in its default state. So we're seeing things move around and we're seeing that the spectrum is real time and that it's quite granular. So I'm gonna make a couple of quick tweaks here. One, I'm gonna change the block size to 8192 and I'm gonna activate some smoothing. So we just do that in the gear icon for settings right here. And let's take a look at what this looks like. So this is giving me much more meaningful information to look at the mix as a whole. The next thing I'm gonna do is activate long-term averaging. So right here under the type, we can see we're on RT, which stands for real-time average. You have a bunch of different options here, but AVG means long-term average. You'll see the averaging time parameter is grayed out now. And this will create a permanent frozen spectrum, which is what I'm looking for here. Okay, great, that's our first step. And then you can change the color if you want. I usually make my master blue, that's just me. And you can click to clear the averaged spectrum. So now we need to set up the routing and this is where the intricate part comes in. So we go over here to the routing area, we click this, and we're going to enable one of the inputs. So the sidechain inputs come in here on input three and four. So I'm just gonna take input three and I'm gonna select E. So C and D are your left and right, which is your main spectrum that it's inserted on. And E is gonna be the sidechain input. Now, one important thing I'm gonna point out is that all of my reference tracks I've put into mono using a utility. And the reason for that is because I don't wanna look at just the left side or just the right side. I'm wanting to look at the spectrum mono averaged. So that's why I've done that. And if we go back to span, we open up that routing area again. 
we can see that we have these things called group assignments. So group assignments, we can see C and D are both assigned to group one. So that's actually my master. And E is assigned to group two. So group two is going to be the spectrum for my reference track. Now what we need to do is rename the groups. We can use this little guy right here and we can just type in master and then reference. So we can see now the group names appear in the bottom left and we can toggle between the groups. Okay, that's ace. So now let's go ahead and click on the reference. Our next step is to route something into the audio sidechain of span so that it will begin to read a spectrum on the reference. So let's go ahead and grab reference one and quickly play it. So we can see we're getting a signal, which is great. So now let's go through our settings here and quickly make them the same as my original main spectrum on the master. So block size, 8192. We're gonna add that third of an octave smoothing. We're gonna change the spectrum from real time to average, and that should get us something very similar. Okay, great. So now we can change the color. I usually like uh, something like this. And if we go flip back to our master, now we will be able to see them. But there's one extra step you need to take here. You can, from each spectrum, you can create an underlay. So you can see from the master, I can choose the underlay of the reference. And now I see them over top of each other, which is exactly what we want. I usually go back to the reference and open up the settings again. And instead of making it a filled display, I make it a line. And that just makes it a little easier for me to compare and see which one's the master and which one's the reference. So now we're seeing something similar to what I started with. Awesome. If we want to clear the spectrum, we just click it. And now we can flip through and go to the different reference tracks. Great. So you can see that they are moving and you usually want them to stabilize. So I play them through usually about eight bars and that will capture enough of information into the snapshot where they really do stabilize and give you a general impression of what the mix is doing at that point in time. Now that we've got the setup dialed, I want to talk to you guys about how you might use this information to improve your mixes. So let's grab the reference number two and compare that with my master. Okay, so we've got the spectrums in and we can begin to analyze the differences between the tracks. So one of the things that you'll see is that the tracks are written in different keys. So you're seeing the bass peak at a different frequency point. That's normal, that's fine. We're seeing that the bass levels are roughly the same. They're quite close to each other. And then we're seeing that everything in the low mids all the way up to the upper mids is actually conforming really nicely. But then you see things diverge up top when we get north of about 2K. We can see that my master actually has a significant amount of high energy that is not there in the reference track. And now you have to make the determination is, is this something that I need to correct about my mix? Is this actually an error? Or is this something that's unique about my arrangement that I have, how I've set up the track? And is it something that I'm comfortable with? And in this case, because my track features a female vocal that has a lot of air in it, I've intentionally boosted the top end of the mix, particularly with her vocal. I also have a lot of top end synths, the future bass super saw synths that are taking up a lot of space in the chorus as well. Up here, let's listen to the master so you can really hear what I'm talking about. That's a difference that I'm actually comfortable with. I wanted this track to be brighter. I wanted the top end of the vocal to be more prominent. I want people to hear all of the lyrics and the vocals really are the feature element in my song. So I'm not gonna dig into things much deeper than that. We've um, discovered some cool ways to look at the spectrums of reference tracks. And what you do with that information is up to you as an engineer. It's a personal and unique decision, but now you can at least pretty objectively compare without worrying about problems with your room or the acoustic response of your speakers and really get scientific about how your tracks are looking from a spectrum perspective against reference tracks. 
All right, guys, so to wrap up, I wanted to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is in no way am I advocating that you primarily are mixing using visual tools. We mix with our ears, we are listening on speakers in real acoustic spaces, and there's no substitute for that. So this is just an extra tool that I wanna give you guys to put in your bag of tricks for engineering music. So it's meant to supplement good acoustic studio mixing principles, not to replace them. You know, absolutely, I want you guys to continue to invest into your rooms, get acoustic treatment, upgrade your monitors, reference your mix in headphones, use all of those tools and always be improving your setup. But this is a great addition to your workflow. The other thing I wanted to say is don't get stuck in the temptation in the rabbit hole of trying to get your track, your spectrum to match the spectrum of a reference track. That is a dangerous path, my friends. A lot of engineers I know, myself included, have been there. And when you're just obsessing over little details between your track and a single other reference track because you're trying to get it to match maybe one of your favorite producers, that is a bad idea. Really what we're looking to do with this process is simply make broad comparisons and in particular, I find this technique is really, really great at helping you to dial in the low end of your track. That's the part that most of us struggle with, and it's because low frequencies are the most difficult to get right in an acoustic space in a room. So most people in most studios have problems with the low end in the room, it makes it very difficult to get it right because you can't hear what you're doing. So this technique allows you to really objectively and scientifically compare back and forth without having a room and an acoustic space in the equation, how does your low end look in comparison to that of a reference track? And rather than comparing to a single reference track, it's great to compare to several reference tracks that all are in the same genre and of the same style. So that way you can make general comparisons between your work and the work of other producers and engineers. Awesome. So I hope you guys are feeling super inspired to use this in your own music. I've dropped some sweet links below the video for you so you guys can grab Span if you don't have it and check out some of the other tutorials. Hope you guys are just doing great and working on music and I really hope to catch you in the next video. Peace.